Hi folks, it's myself. I'm pulling into my chair to sit down on a Saturday afternoon and talk to you on a Monday morning or Tuesday or Wednesday or whenever. The reality is I am not going to be able to be in with you this week. Probably not next week, week after, so on and so forth. But even though I wasn't told that we're going to be doing this online, I thought it'd be as well to prepare something online. Hence, you get Shakespeare on a video screen. Now, before you turn off thinking that you're covered, there are some things I need you to do to get your participation point. I don't know if you're watching this or not. I mean, you do you. But I do me means I have to know that you actually participated. So you're going to have to watch this. I'm going to have maybe two or three things that I need you to do and send it to me in an email. And if you do those things... Not only do you get your participation point, you get three participation points. Tough. That's how I'm going to be running this as long as I'm doing this because I have a nasty feeling we may not actually get the opportunity to come back in and do our final uh, thing and I don't want to turn it into a paper to finish. So all of these until I know different. We're going to have at least bonus points, and in the end, maybe they're the actual points. So that's the uh, good and or bad news. I'm going to try and keep it to an hour, because I'm giving you actual work to do on your own time. Sending me an email, watching a video, that kind of thing. Shouldn't be too much rocket science. Not even, uh, yeah, I'll talk about it more as I get along. Firstly, how was your day? How was your week? No, no, go on. Go on, this time. I mean, pause the video and then tell me. But you can do that now. So, before we get going, uh, also wash your hands. Did you all wash your hands before coming in here to watch this? Wash your hands. It's the, it's the difference between life and death these days. So, we're doing Shakespeare this week, Monday and Wednesday. I'll be expecting something back from people by Wednesday for Monday and by the following Monday for Wednesday, if that makes sense. So there'll be details in the email. There'll also be links and stuff that will be useful for you. Uh, read it. It'll be helpful. Trust me. Watch it and do it at your own time. But we're doing Shakespeare this week, and this week only. You're, doing, you're getting away very well. In college, uh, if you're studying theatre or literature, you're probably going to spend at least a semester talking about Shakespeare. And we're talking about... A minimum of 16 to 30 hours of exploring Shakespeare. If you're doing theatre for real, it depends where you're doing it. Not so common here. In Britain and in Ireland, you'll be expecting at least one semester of two classes of Shakespeare a week. Or thereabouts. And you've got to ask yourself, why? Why are we doing Shakespeare today? How relevant is Shakespeare in the modern world? What connection do we have to Shakespeare? Well, there's a couple of questions that come up, really. Do we need to do Shakespeare? What do we learn from Shakespeare? Should we be covering him in school? First thing I'll say is we should not be covering Shakespeare in high school or elementary school or anything like that. Shakespeare is something that, if you're interested, yeah, you should get the opportunity. But we don't do T.S. Eliot's hard work when we're in high school. We don't do the likes of Ulysses when we're in high school. We don't do the hardest uh, material from the great authors. We do stuff that connects with us and resonates to us. And let's face it, none of us are from 400 years ago in England. None of us speak the English the same way. I know this is going to be, sound surprising, but the English of Shakespeare is a lot closer to us than the English of 100 years before him. In a weird way, part of the reason we do Shakespeare is he is the foundations of our language. Much more so, it's much more connectable than, say, Chaucer. The English language, they say, the first modern English kind of shows up in Chaucer. But really, it's not anything like what we have now through Shakespeare. Why do we do Shakespeare? Have you ever watched a movie or spoken the language? Or, or been involved in culture. We live in the Anglosphere, the world that is influenced heavily and dominated by the English language. That Anglosphere grows wider and wider. And 
he is taken as sort of the totem, the beginning point for the English language, the beginning point for English culture and the beginning point for, you know, storytelling with people as opposed to with words. Is this right? No. Is he the best of them? In my opinion, he's not the best of the people in his time, never mind the best of all writers. Yeah. That's my personal view. I love Shakespeare, don't get me wrong, I am boring like that. But Shakespeare is not necessarily the best. Is he the greatest? Mm, what's greatest? Was Muhammad Ali the greatest ever bo uh, boxer? He's probably the greatest ever athlete, but not necessarily the greatest boxer. That would be how I'd feel that. Um, Shakespeare's importance is more significant than his ability in some ways. Because he did do a lot that we have now. A lot of the writers of movies in the early eras, playwriters for centuries, and writers of TV now, similarly to the way that they took the structure from the Greeks, they take inspiration from Shakespeare. The Greeks focused on just one thing. The people in Shakespeare's time would have subplots and secondary subplots and multiple different characters as opposed to we're focusing just on this one thing. So he's a massive influence. Anyone out there watch Empire? That first season is King Lear. I think there's another season is Romeo and Juliet. It comes up again and again and again. This is not me saying this to get you to like him or even to get you to go and read him. Shakespeare was not meant to be written, was not meant to be read in the first place. It was meant to be performed. However, it is me saying this in order to get you to acknowledge that there's a purpose to him. Is it a daily purpose? No, not at all. I love Shakespeare. Don't get me wrong. I'm aiming, if this coronavirus thing ever gets gone, I'm aiming on directing uh, Hamlet with somebody. I've been sort of fluidly around Shakespeare for a couple of decades now. But that does not mean that he is the only writer, the only artist. I, there, there are multiples of playwrights I prefer to him. But he is worth studying because of his significance culturally. He is a big deal. Because of his significance in terms of the making and writing and direct, uh, creation of film, TV and plays. And also because of the language. Now we'll talk about the language in a little bit. That is important. But... Um, I suppose the question is, you don't have to, well, not the question. The point is you don't have to like Shakespeare. You don't have to, after this class, go and read and watch all the Shakespeare plays and become an expert on Kenneth Branagh, who directed a load of them and stuff like that. It's knowing about it is what I want for this class. I'd much rather, as I always say, I'd much rather you come and tell somebody, yeah, I don't care for Shakespeare, and here is why. Here is why anybody or any author you want is better than him because he doesn't speak to today in 1600s uh, England yeah he's on it but even then he's not you know the only the unique the most important voice he was just one an upstart crow is how he was characterized by some folks they didn't really like him a lot of the people the university wits as they were called the intellectual and uh, well-studied people they did not care for him. And I should probably address this now. There is a whole to do about who wrote Shakespeare. Now, I know one of you is definitely saying, hey, was he gay? And it's like, we don't know. He was married, married a woman called Anne Hathaway. Not that Anne Hathaway, the other one. And she was older than him. And he moved, he, they had twins, one of whom died. And then he moved off to London and he worked in the theatre for ages. He was mostly an actor originally. Uh, he was a part owner of that theatre. And what we do know about him is he started writing plays. Now there's a whole thing, we call it the authorship debate. And the authorship debate is basically, did Shakespeare write the works of Shakespeare? And there's a lot of argument against that. The first thing is, he only has the lower part of what we would consider a high sc school education. He's really got a middle school education at best. Back 400 years ago, he doesn't know Jack. He, he never traveled, even though he writes abroad very well and succinctly. He didn't go to university. He isn't from a theatrical background. 
arguably, people say, how could he possibly be the writer of his plays because they speak so much to us? The argument is always offered, you know, he's the son of a glove maker. So as you know, glove makers, the world famous producers of playwrights. The problem is, and we go back to that old class thing, before ever we had race, we had class. And this class thing has been going on for a century, saying that he has to have been the Earl of Oxford, or it's Queen Elizabeth's secret name, or maybe it was Christopher Marlowe. Marlowe came back, pretended to be dead, and he came back and he wrote Shakespeare's plays. Nah. This argument, because it really doesn't matter who wrote those words, but the argument is ultimately put there to say, you, you are not wealthy. You were not born into education. You didn't have everything handed to you. You can't be a great writer. That's rubbish. I don't know which of you is listening in on this right now, but you could well be the next great writer of our generation. Doesn't matter whether you're from a rich family or a poor family or a Midland family. There's no saying. This is why for me, the authorship debate is important. If we say, oh, well, Shakespeare, supposedly our greatest writer, could not have been an ordinary poor to middle class man, then what hope is there for the rest of us? We all have to be lords and ladies. We all have to have had education at the finest schools. Go to Harvard, go to all, you know, go to St. X, go to whichever is the greatest schools in the world or will never make it. The authorship debate is a, an exercise in putting normal people down and preventing them from being the amazing and wonderful people they can be. So I would always say, I don't really care who wrote Shakespeare, but what I do care is that people realize that it could be a normal person, somebody who wasn't from anything. Remember my first job? Shoveling the excrement of the pig and the cow. I'm doing okay for myself, coming from literally nothing. Well, from shit. Shh, don't tell anybody I said that word. Anyway, um, moving on. Yeah, why, why is popular still? He's always going to be popular with those boring old farts who feel that, well, because it's old and because everybody says it's good, it must be good. And that's not true. There are some really bad Shakespeare plays. Two noble kinsmen, muck. Wasted an hour of my life trying to read that opening uh, scene. It's not good. He has some good ones, though. And this, this, this is the two things. Shakespeare has some very good stories. Because at the end of the day, you know, these stories get retold. Like I said with Empire, that's King Lear retold. Uh, and that's not inconsiderable. I will quote, as I always do, that famous uh, story, famous line from the Bible, Every, uh, there is nothing new under the sun, which is showing up in Samuel Beckett's work, in Pink Floyd's work, all over the place. Okay. So he took old stories. There may be, he may have had one original story, but he really took old stories and revisited them, jazzed them up, made them relevant to people from, who he knew would be going to the theatre, and brought them to a, a larger public and threw in some interesting twists and turns. That's the main thing with him. It's not that he is writing original stories. The other thing he did, oh, and none of them back then did. The other thing he did really well is he wrote beautiful language. The words he used were quite beautiful in many ways. Now I'm gonna look at the language little bit uh, thing for a little bit. And then we're going to go on uh, play a little game and the first of the things that I'm going to get you to do at home and submit. Okay, so first up, uh, let me get this thing. Okay, hang on, uh, I have to sit over here. So the poetry bit, that's what I call it. This is uh, one of the attachments on the email. It's a Word document, it's probably called Stage Tricks. It's got this and more stuff that I'll talk about later. But it's useful to have a read of. Uh, and you can read it in depth. I'm not going to go into it in depth. There's two, there's two bits to it. Let me add the other one in now. And, oh, oh, uh, hang on. Let me see. There we go. Here we go. Hello there. So the poetry bit, the, the things I'm going to point out first and foremost is um, we always talk about iambic pentameter. You can read that up. Basically, at the end of the day, oh, this is going to be tricky. It matches our heartbeats. So it's like 
Ta-dum, 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 ta-dum. Because, uh, and you'll see it in a lot of places. He didn't invent it. It was invented by a guy called Christopher Marlowe. Well, he didn't invent anything. Uh, he didn't even invent blank verse. Uh, Christopher Marlowe did. Biambic pentameter kind of mirrors the rhythm of our heart, which is why it makes it easier to learn the lines and it also is more memorable. You know, simple little thing is, I think I'll go to Dublin in the morning is a perfect beat of iambic pentameter. You can read all about that. Rhyming couplets is very interesting, and I will point that out because you're looking at uh, actors who are mixed in, mixed in their abilities in terms of literature as well as everything else. And you're also looking at an audience who can understand the words, but they definitely couldn't read. A rhyming couplet generally signified that we're getting to the end of a scene or that somebody's about to come in. You know, at the end, uh, and sometimes when you go to a play or a show and you don't know it's over, you like hold off, wait, is that it? And you wait to applaud. Or worse, they add in a little bit extra and you applaud too soon. Most of his plays end with a rhyming couplet. For never was a tale of more woe than this of Juliet and her Romeo. Audience goes, oh, yep, that's a rhyme. We'll go and applaud that now. Good, good, good work. Great stuff. Similarly so, you're waiting backstage. And I have, I have been that soldier working in Shakespeare plays. And you're waiting for your cue to go on. Do you really need to learn all the lines? Or do you need to know who's speaking? And, oh, wait, they've hit, they've hit a rhyme. There we go. In I come. It's, I need to mention that sometimes it can be hard to say these words without lapsing into the, for never was a story of more woe than this of Juliet and a Romeo. You want to say them like words. Actors have a big difficulty with that. we got metaphor and that kind of stuff, and that's grand and all, but the thee and thou thing, those of you who know your King James will understand thee and thou much better than the average punter. Uh, in French and in German and in many different languages, we have what you call a polite or formal form of the word you, and an informal one. And people today, because we don't use the words anymore and they look archaic and old and important, think that thee and thou are what you would say to somebody who is important. And you is just something you say to each other. Well, it's weird. We actually use the formal version. So if I'm talking to a better or an elder, I would say you back in these days. And if I'm talking to the dog or my child, uh, or given the sexism of the time, a woman, I would probably say thee and thou. When God speaks to us in the King James Bible, he does say, say go thee and go thou. Because in the King James Bible, at least, I don't know if there's Bibles that have different, God is more important and more formal than us. And we, sp we speak to you with the capital Y. So thee and thou, it's a useful thing to note. Let me, let me get my breath and catch back in here. Now, I always talk about how, ah, there we go, there we go. Uh, I always talk about how great Shakespeare's poetry and all that malarkey is. And it's pretty good, it's pretty good. But it feels disconnected from us today. It feels disconnected from who we are, from where we are, from, from, from what we're doing. So, it's, you know, what you get. Shakespeare's words, they're all well and good, but... Is it, is it how we speak? Occasionally. Occasionally we, we grasp metaphor and we really do something interesting. You know, like, did you go to the game today? No, the game was a washout. Now, that sounds like an ordinary everyday thing to say, or maybe it's only in Ireland. I don't know. Tell me if, you, if, it's, if it's something you don't say or you do say. But a washout is metaphorical language. It's using one thing to describe another. And that's important. Because it shows up, maybe not in everyday life all the time, but it shows up in music, in poetry, in song, all over the place. So I'm going to leave a link in the uh, heading to a guy called Akala, who's a grime artist from Britain, who's also a Shakespeare fan and teacher. Uh, for those of you who follow British hip-hop, Lady Dynamite was his sister. She's good, look her up. She is. It's 20 years ago now, though. Feels like a long time. Anyway. He has a game called Shakespeare or Hip Hop, which we are now about to play. Let me call this up. Um, this is this is not ideal. This is suboptimal. Okay, so I'm going to give you the answers to this as well as the questions. Uh, have a read of them, and I'll read them all out, and then I'll tell you what the answers are, and then I'm going to give you this a version of this game to play at home on a smaller scale. 
I don't mind whether you get the answers wrong or right. I don't mind whether you simply click through. I just want you to send it back with uh, an S or an H beside each question so I know that you've gone through this. Sorry. I'm going to give you the reduced version, which is about 10 questions as opposed to the 20. I saw one of these ones with about 80. I enjoyed that hour and a half. You might not, or maybe you will, but Shakespeare or hip hop. So starting off, to destroy the beauty from which one came. Maybe it's the hatred I spew. Maybe it's food for the spirit. Men would rather use their broken records than their bare hands. I was not born under a rhyming planet. The most benevolent king communicates through your dreams. Socrates, philosophy, and hypotheses can't define me. Now, you should right now be going, uh, which is which? What is what? Who is who? So the very first one is hip-hop. It's Jay-Z. Uh, to destroy the beauty from which one came. Second up, we've got Eminem. Also hip-hop just in case you didn't know who Eminem was. He's not a character in Shakespeare. The third one is from Shakespeare's play Othello. Yeah, men would rather use their broken records than their bare hands. It would fit well into hip hop, in my opinion, or, you know, bad country music or good dance music, depending on what you're into. Probably fit into good country music too. Uh, I Was Not Born Under a Rhyming Planet also comes from Shakespeare, from Much Ado About Nothing. And the last two, because Maybe I have some biases in my life. They both come from the Wu-Tang Clan. Uh, yep, the clan is respon the, the good clan, not the other one, is responsible for that. So, I'm going to scoot back into the center and take this off my face for a moment. So that should give you... Where's the thing for this? So that should give you a little bit of an idea. The language is the language. So, what I would ask... Make a note of it now, pause this video if you want. I don't mind, I don't even care. What I want you to do now is go to your email or do it after if you want, I don't mind. And you're gonna get 10, quest uh, 10 quotes, numbered one to 10. And when you, I want you to reply to this in the body of the email and beside each number and or beside each quote, Right, H or S. Simply hip hop or Shakespeare. Right, and uh, email it back to me, and that'll help. Uh, and I will go through it. If you want me to grade you, what? I will send on the other, the answers next week. But uh, if you want to have a look at it, do send it on to me, and then that, that'll let me know that you've watched to at least the twenty third minute of this video, which would be pretty decent. Now, we're going to go on and talk a little bit about Shakespeare. And the first thing I'm going to say is, you see this little picture of Shakespeare here in the pimp hat? That is not Shakespeare in a pimp hat. That is Sir Walter Raleigh. Sir Walter Raleigh is another great uh, monstrous jerk who considered himself one of the fantastic explorers, went around the world in the Golden Hind, because that's what he named his boat, the Golden Hind. And he brought the potato to Ireland, which is both the sum of our, our troubles and our joys, or so it seems to be. You can distill potatoes. Just saying. Just saying. Um, no, that is not Walter Raleigh in the pimp hat. Sorry, that is not Shakespeare in the pimp hat. That is Walter Raleigh in the pimp hat. This is Shakespeare. And uh, I played that little trick. Number one, because it's another thing that you can do. I want you in your return email to give me the hashtag Shakespeare ain't no pimp. That's Shakespeare ain't no pimp. And send me that back. And uh, the other reason I'm doing it is because I wanted you to think a little bit more about what we know about Shakespeare. There was no image of him taken when he was alive. This image here, and yes, this one is Shakespeare, comes from the cover of the first... Let me see, can I do this? Yeah, uh, where, this guy here, or maybe this guy here. That might be the thing you want to use. This guy here, uh, the first image, this is from the publication of his uh, plays after his death. The only other image, there's a statue, or sorry, a bust of him over his grave in Stratford-upon-Avon. There are no other images of him. All those pictures you see of Shakespeare on books and stuff, made up. 
When the National Portrait Gallery in England set up in 1860, they wanted to get a definitive picture of Shakespeare. 60 different images were sent in of him, all purporting to be authentic. Now, we don't have a death mask. I think we have a death mask. That might be all we have from when he was alive, and obviously he was dead when the death mask was made. Like a lot of things, people have taken the opportunity to try and invent the Shakespeare they want. There was a guy called, I think, William Ireland in the 1700s when Shakespeare mania was getting to a peak and he forged a new play by Shakespeare, which by all accounts was awful. But he made a fortune selling it. People have forged uh, all kinds of bits and pieces of his work to make themselves rich and sell them on. The funny thing is, 50 years after his death, he died in, uh, well, you'll see that in a minute. 50 years after his death, people were taking his place going, yeah, I like this King Lear thing, but it's a very sad ending. So let's have the good guys live and marry each other. They changed uh, lots of stuff around. I think one person described it as a Shakespeare as a string of gems, unpolished and uncut. Which meant, there's some great stuff here, but we've got to fix all that. It was really only about, uh, given that he wrote his plays 200 years, uh, 400 years ago, between the 1650s and 1790s, Shakespeare was not done as Shakespeare was written. He was studied in school as he was written, and uh, sorry, in university, but he was not performed as he was written. It's really only in the last 150, 200 years that we have come to see Shakespeare as was written. And that said, we cut. We cut an awful lot. So I'm going to have a look over the next few moments about at Shakespeare's contemporaries, the people with whom he lived, with whom he worked, with whom he had rivalries, and stuff like that. So let's press on. William Shakespeare, this is kind of how we see him. But because it's me, I'm not going to do it straight up. I'm going to look at him as though they were major directors of the early 1980s because my film knowledge stopped in about 1989. After that first Batman film, I've not really paid much attention since. I believe they are still making movies, uh, which you should watch at home, coronavirus and all that. Anyway, this is what we kind of see of Shakespeare. This is a little bit more like who Shakespeare is in his day. In his day, he was Steven Spielberg. Yeah, he wasn't the biggest thing around, but he was the biggest playwright around. He was very popular. Everybody talked about him. Uh, and here are his dates. According to legend, he was born on the 23rd of April, although it looks like more realistically that was when he was baptized. And he supposedly died on the 23rd of April as well, which we actually know, which is St. George's Day. And given that he's like the head honcho of English literature. So it kind of, in terms of developing an English culture, it's kind of suitable for it to be that day. It sounds right. He wrote 36 plays, or 38, or 40, maybe 50. We don't know. We know 36 for sure. Plays like Pericles, which I love, are definitely a co-writing, and he didn't probably do the first act. Uh, other plays he wrote, he contributed two or three uh, things to, two or three acts. Like Edward III, I think, is a play he wrote, but he only contributed maybe the first two acts. Other people wrote the rest of them. We forget, in these days, a lot of the time, these plays were being written like by writer's rooms, as we would say in the modern context. People would collaborate. They'd hand things back and forth to each other. Also, they robbed from each other blind. If you wrote a play and somebody got hold of it and performed it before you did, it didn't matter that you wrote it. It all, it all belonged to the other company. He was initially famous for writing poetry about sex chiefly things like the rape of Lucere and Venus and Adonis, and that got his attention, especially during the time of the, uh, the plague. There was a plague in uh, 1594. People didn't go to plays, and that was the time when he had time to write uh, four of his major, major works. The, the two poems I talked about, which he was able to sell on the street, and that became popular because nobody's going out, they're reading. And he also wrote Romeo and Juliet and Midsummer Night's Dream, all in this one year. This is what made him huge. It also helped that his biggest rival, who we'll talk about in a moment, died the previous year. Moving on. 
stole all his better stories, didn't really invent anything. He, um, he perfected things. He did well with things. He didn't invent anything. He didn't write any stories. Sorry, uh, 1593, I get my years wrong. 1593 was the breakthrough year, and that was the year of the plague in London. He came from nothing, and he went back to Stratford-upon-Avon, where he was born in the, in the end, the richest man in the city. Presumably to a wife who'd been wondering, where have you been for the last 10 or 15 years? Christopher Marlowe. This is the guy from this area I like. Uh, he's the Francis Ford Coppola of the age. You can see, died 1593, no coincidence. Wrote seven plays, many poems, invented blank verse. So much more popular. Uh, Dr. Faustus is his most famous work, which he stole from a German book called the Historia von Johann von Faustus, which is about a guy who does a deal with the devil and ends out badly on the back of it. Uh, he, was, he also was born poor, by the way, and he had to get scholarships to go to school. But because of those scholarships, he eventually got, went to college and it is believed he probably was a spy. He went to France at a time when you did not go to France. Mysterious stuff. Died in a bar fight that he wasn't a part of. A fight broke out in a bar in uh, Deptford over a game of cards that he wasn't playing. And somehow he got killed and uh, he got stabbed under the eye. Very mysterious uh, circumstances. I'll just say that it's the... Uh, the two other people involved in the bar fight, neither of whom were killed and who were doing the fighting, they were both uh, employees of the spymaster general, Francis Walsingham, in England at that time. Mysterious. Some people, conspiracy theorists, believe that he died, he staged his own death and then went on to write all the rest of Shakespeare's plays. Bull pies. Thomas Kidd is the Martin Scorsese, kind of visceral, gritty. He. Most of his works are believed lost. You can see he's only lived a year longer than Marlowe. Christopher Marlowe was his roommate, the person he lived with. And he was most famous for the Spanish tragedy, which is gruesome and fun. He died poor, uh, only just released from prison where he was tortured for information, particularly about Marlowe. Now, one of the things going back to Marlowe is he was, he would not have survived if he was not probably in the pay of the spy master general because he would go around saying things like um, that all men who love not boys and tobacco are fools he was definitely gay uh, which in the, at that time was not cool it was not safe it was alleged that tom's kid was one of his lovers he was scandalous kid was tortured Ben Jonson was kind of like Milos Forman. There are a wide variety of things and very, very beautiful things, very uh, engaging and very highly rated, but nobody really cares about him very much anymore. Good match. He's younger than the others. Wrote 17 plays and 36 masks. A mask is a different kind of play. We'll look at that either today or the next day. I'll talk about it a little bit, but briefly. Best known for Valpone, which is a scabrous satirical work, which I really like, but again... We're not talking about him. He's important if only because he wrote about all the other playwrights. He's how we have most of our information about Shakespeare because we don't know very much, but we know more about Shakespeare than any other playwright of the era. We got John Webster, George A. Romero, gruesome, grotesque, really <sighs> kind of stuff. He's, uh, if, if, he's uh, collaborated with others most of the time. You can see he lived a little bit longer. Wrote dark and gruesome plays. And really importantly, he plumbed the depths of the human soul in terms of how wicked, how evil, how na nasty and naughty we can be. And this is something we need to know about these people. They were into the grotesque. They enjoyed the wretched and the vile, the rough and tumble. So one of his, his most famous play, The Duchess of Malfi, is about three kids who are uh, royal. One goes on to be a cardinal who has a series of prostitutes and is trying to be basically a manipulative schemer in terms of running the way the, his uh, city-state worked. The uh, wife, sorry, the sister, secretly marries a servant, which is again another big no-no. And uh, she ends up being killed by her brother, her two brothers, because the third brother goes on to be the Duke of Malfi and is sexually obsessed with her. So there's a whole incest thing going on. Yeah, meaty stuff. 
Then we have uh, Beaumont and Fletcher, the Ilya and Alexander Salkind of things, in that they did a couple of things working together, but at the end of the day, they came to hate each other, and we don't really see their stuff anymore. They're a playwriting team. Uh, John uh, Fletcher wrote, uh, probably wrote with Shakespeare on a couple of plays, including Dr. Faustus, which is the closest thing to an original play he had. Shakespeare, that is. Some of the actors of the time, the two big ones were basically Tom or Ned Allen, uh, who I would say is Tom Hanks. Fingers crossed, Tom. Hopefully coronavirus doesn't get you. I know he's got it at the moment. Fingers crossed he doesn't die. He's one of the good guys. And he's big. Uh, probably the best actor in his day. Was in a, a theatre company called Lord Strange's Men. Here, this is a good thing that I put this in because the different theatre companies, they all needed a sponsor. So Shakespeare's company was known as the Lord Chamberlain's Men and then eventually when they got a better sponsor, the King's Men. Because if you didn't have a royal type backing you, people would come in and break up your stuff. Literally, it was not uncommon for a theatre company to march over to where another theatre company was working, to their theatre, and wreck the place. But if you had royal, uh, or better again, get somebody like the Lord Chamberlain, the person who had the yay and nay on all plays, and get them to close your theatre down. So, Lord Strange's men, they were the big group before Shakespeare's crowd took over. Christopher Marlowe worked with them, and he was probably the first ever Tamburlaine, that was the first ever Faustus. These massive roles for the 1890s. He retired at the top of his game in 1898. Comparatively young, you can see he's like about 32 when he retired. That's pretty early for an actor. He married the theatre owner's daughter and then moved into property management. And then he owned theatres. Bear Pits, was the other, which was one of the other major entertainments of the day. And brothels. And he founded Dulwich College. You can't beat good uh, prostitute money. Richard Burbage was kind of more like Jack Nicholson, who is an actor who I don't think is great, but is considered to be great. He is distinctive, and that's Burbage. You can see he lived a little bit longer. Uh, sorry, not lived a little bit longer. He acted a lot longer. Considered only second in ability to Ned Allen, but it was only when Allen di uh, retired that Burbage became the big deal. He was the main man in the Lord Chamberlain's Men, which is Shakespeare's company, and they were later called the King's Men. He was short and stout, so he's not what you would expect of a Hamlet or a King Lear or any of these parts. And he was playing these parts way out of time. If you look, Hamlet is probably 31. He, in six, in, he would have been just 40 when Shakespeare wrote the play. Hamlet is generally considered 30, 31. So he'd been, too, uh, he'd been older. He was dead long ever before he reached 80, and King Lear is meant to be 80. And Othello is black, not white. He was, he was God knows what he did to portray the part. He was a theatre owner as well. He, he's the one responsible for building the globe. And then subsequently, he built uh, theatres like the uh, Blackfriars Theatre, which was the first indoor theatre. And he died an actor. I don't think he died on stage, but he died an actor. So we come back to the question. Why did all these big wigs and hoo-hahs and what have you, how did they become the old, dead, white men that we constantly talk about when we talk about the great era of theatre, of the time of William Shakespeare, him there, to the side of me? Why did they get to be the ones? Well, the first thing is it was a unique place and time. You'll notice that this is one of three golden ages of drama that happened with the major European powers. Germany never got one, but there was, there's only been a Germany for about 150 years now. The main uh, golden ages of drama from, an English, from a European standpoint, from a Western world standpoint, are the Spanish one, which slightly predates this, the English one, which is roughly 1585, up to about 1620, and the French one, which came a little bit later. You will notice that these three dates coincide with a couple of things happening. In all cases, it is at one of the peaks of their colonial power, i.e., in short, this was when these countries were robbing the most from the new worlds, as we called them, from the places where 
people were less technologically developed and could be subjugated easiest. Spain became great because it was robbing all the gold from South America and that fueled its golden age because when you've got a large and wealthy population you then have a large disposable income and you've got people with free time and so that's a time when going out to enjoy yourself at the theatre even if you're poor is manageable. The cheapest tickets to go into Shakespeare's theatres in the theatres of those days was about a penny and most people could spare a penny here and there. As time, it's true in the Greek era and in the Roman era, the better theatre comes earlier on before things get too wealthy for too long. You'll see there's a degree to which this uh, is true of the United States. We have been pillaging other countries, having pillaged the people who lived in our own for so long, that we've been able to go through golden ages of our own literature but and in particularly in this regard rather than uh, theatre, TV and uh, film but now we're starting to get to the far end where all we're doing is sequels and remakes. That's kind of what happened to Shakespeare, to, uh, to Shakespeare's England, to Moliere's France and to Calderon's uh, Spain. At a certain point we've just been wealthy for so long, eh, we get lazy. Happened in Rome, happened in Greece, happens everywhere. Uh, that's one major thing. The Spanish were robbing South, South America. The British then uh, hired privateers, or as we understand them now, pirates, to rob the Spanish ships. That's how Britain got wealthy. And the French went, oh, well, we're going to do something somewhere else and take from there, which was most of Africa and large chunks of Asia. They had had their own colonies in the New World. It did not work out. Um, but, you know, they, they all robbed, and that's what funded it. So wealth. High disposable income, that's the first major thing. The second key thing I would say is the change in religion. Britain had been a Catholic country up until the 1530s. Then uh, when the king said, oh, these Protestants, they're all terrible. Wait, I can't get a divorce? I'm starting my own religion. That's Henry VIII for you. And to be honest, British leaders the whole way through history. Uh, you jump forward in time, you had a Catholic in charge for a very short space of time, they didn't like her, uh, she got killed, then Elizabeth, the, uh, Elizabeth II takes over. She was in charge for a long time. She, she basically created stability after a lot of uncertainty, which allowed for it to be safer to be a writer. Then when King James came in, he himself had been one of the uh, more stringent uh, Protestant religions, uh, Calvinism. Hello, Calvinists. And when coming down to Britain, he had been the King of Scotland, a Calvinist nation. Then he became, by inheritance, the King of England as well. Became James the Seventh of Scotland became James the First of England. Kind of uniting the two kingdoms didn't happen formally for another hundred years, but he loved what was possible. And he commissioned people, he commissioned the best poets and playwrights to write the uh, book of uh, the King James Bible, which meant that all these people suddenly had money, the writers, so they could actually devote time to their tasks uh, as writers. It also, um, his arrival heralded more fun and more uh, freedom. If you think about it, in Queen Elizabeth's time, there was, a lot of mur there was a lot of people killed because of their religion. Um, Mary, Queen of Scots, got her head chopped off, for instance. Lots of people were executed. There was lots of murder. There was lots of intrigue. So you're coming out of a period of great uncertainty into a period of, oh, thank God, God that's over. What will we go and watch? Let's go watch a play that features all the themes that were prevalent for such a long time. But now we're past it, it'll be okay. So the change in religion was a big thing. The third thing was, as I mentioned earlier, the language. A hundred years before, uh, if you look at plays like Everyman, so much, uh, there was so much inconsistency in spelling within that play itself. It was a very new language. People had been speaking Old English, which was basically closer to German as we would understand it now than English. The same grammar, a lot of similar words, but you know, plurals uh, would often end with an N or an E as often as with an S. But language was becoming standardized. 
So slang was starting to appear, and that was starting to go into the place, which meant, meant the, made them more exciting and interesting. People were also more used to traveling thanks to the exploitation of the new worlds, and people were open for new ideas. The, the uh, veil of darkness and ignorance was being cast off uh, in all these terms. So these are just some of the many, many reasons why it cropped up. But I would always say the first one is you always follow the money. And as a nation becomes rich on the back of another, which is normally how it happens, their culture blooms. So anytime you're looking at a place that's got new culture, uh, uh, that's sweeping the world, most of the time you're saying, why is this the case? That's partly why this era is big. And it's also partly why Shakespeare is revered. The English, as it may, even though it may be difficult for us, the English he uses in his plays is much closer to modern English than anything that had been written before or after. In the case of Italy, when it got independence or became a united state as opposed to several city states, they picked who they thought was their greatest writer, in that case Dante, and they adopted the Italian he used, which is a Florentine version. And that is now the standard language in Italy. They could have chosen an Italian from a diff any, many other parts, but they chose him. In our case, because of the popularity of Shakespeare, his is the English we use. So it's about time we looked at Macbeth, I suppose, isn't it? So you remember me talking about King James VII of Scotland, latterly King James I of England. He came down in 1603. He'd been brought up in an incredibly repressive situation. Uh, the Calvinists uh, are... Not about fun. No fun things can happen on a Sunday. There's no drinking, no uh, performance. I think they may have lightened up in uh, following years, but it was very, very uh, stay home, pray, be humble, and uh, expect to be punished by God. In comparison to the Episcopalians or Anglicans or Church of England as it was then known, the name has evolved, uh, and their attitude was hey, it's like we're basically the same as Catholics, but they're all wrong and heretics, and we're going to enjoy ourselves, we're going to enjoy our music, we're going to have fun. Next day, um, I'll talk a little bit about the jig, and those were bawdy and saucy, and they would not be performed today easily, uh, because things changed to make it a little bit more severe. But at that time, um, people were more, much more open sexually, they were much more open uh, imagination-wise in some ways than they were to be in, say, the era of Queen Victoria in the 1800s. So coming from a very repressed place to a very much more open place, think of coming from being a woman in Afghanistan under the Taliban to the United States right now. You don't need to wear your, uh, your burqa, you don't need to, you, you, you're allowed to drive, you are allowed to go and have education. You're allowed to go and enjoy yourself. This was kind of what it was for James I. So he was only too delighted to uh, sponsor, to go to the arts. He loved going to the theatre. And he it was who eventually took over from the Lord Chamberlain as being the chief royal sponsor of Shakespeare's company, who then became the King's Men, as I mentioned earlier. Now, coming down from Scotland with all this going on, in the background of there was a lot of concern about the succession to the throne, Shakespeare's thinking, well, I've got to throw a bone to the man who's given us uh, the go-ahead. So he decided, and for the only time in his career, to write a Scottish play with Scottish characters. Hence Macbeth. It's loosely based on an ancient tale, and it kind of exists in a pre-Christian world. There's not much mention of Jesus or Christ anywhere throughout. Uh, gods are mentioned almost as many times as God. And witches, well, witches are a big thing. Now, I'm going to take a pause away for a moment. I'm going to talk about the curse of Macbeth. So, I work in theatre, and there are many people who I work with who will take the attitude, you cannot say Macbeth near the stage. You can't whistle near the stage. You can't do all these different things. And this is superstition. Macbeth, 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 Macbeth. I had a friend who wrote an awful version of uh, Macbeth as a musical. It was horrific. It, that show was, as we say in Ireland, a shit show. It was terrible. But 
you know, saying Macbeth did not bring a curse on the play. The writing brought the curse on the play. Why do people believe that Macbeth is cursed? Macbeth is a funny one. It is the short of, shortest of Shakespeare's plays, and it's definitely the shortest of his major plays. He's got five or six major, these are important works, like King Lear, Hamlet, Othello, Romeo and Juliet, and Macbeth. And of those big five, this is the shortest. I've seen it done in just, on, just over two hours without an interval. So it can probably be done in shorter as well. I've seen, I know there's a 75 minute version exists. It also has the standard Shakespeare cast list. Because remember, this is the same company putting on all his plays. He's writing for the same people. So the amount of people you'd need for King Lear will also fit the amount of people you'd need for this. And this is important, these two things. It's short, it's one of the great ones, so everybody knows it. And it's also got the right number of people. It's very editable. Lots of people have done it. So it wouldn't be unusual if you're talking to a large crowd of people in a sophisticated city. If you asked, have you done Macbeth? Somebody somewhere is probably going to say, yeah, I've played in Macbeth. I've worked on three or four productions of it myself, not as a director, but in different ways, mostly in lights and stuff like that. And I've seen countless versions because it's a good one. It's fun. It's exciting. There's action, the whole lot. How does this become? These, these are all, things all suggest it should not be a cursed play. How it becomes a cursed play is, oh, we're doing a play like King Lear. And then for whatever reason, the guy who's playing Lear, who's meant to be 80, can't do it. Maybe he's too old. Maybe he has a stroke. Maybe he dies. That happens. So what do you do? You go, oh, well, we all like Shakespeare. Is there a play that most of us have done? Well, I've done Macbeth. I've done Macbeth too. You get people who've got Macbeth, who know Macbeth. It's the right number, roughly, and let's face it, the costumes for ancient Britain and ancient Scotland are probably going to be able to overlap quite a lot. So you do your Macbeth. And in King Lear, there are fights, and there's one duel with two people. There are no other fights on stage. We hear the fighting happening off stage. In Macbeth, uh, the guy playing Macbeth fights about five different people. Now, you're doing this with swords, yeah? So in the first play, we cast based on the main act, uh, on the two guys, Edmund and Edgar. They're, they're the two guys who have a sword fight in King Lear. We cast based on, yeah, you know how to fight with swords. We're now scrambling around, scrambling around to try and get this other play up. And we say, who here can... Uh, so we're going to have to have some sword fights. Anyone here want to be in the sword fights? The parts aren't very big, but you are in a sword fight. Anyone got the experience now you're going to go... I could be in a sword fight, me? Yeah, I'm willing to do the sword fight. Have you experience? Some. Some experience, in many cases, counts as I've played video games where characters have swords. So you got people who do not know what they're doing now doing sword fights. you got everybody going in one direction. We're going towards King Lear. It's a serious play. It's a slow play. It's a play about what it is to be a parent. And now all of a sudden, it's about power, and we need. We've only we 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 used to have twelve weeks to do this. We now have uh, eight. We now have five. You've got people prepared for one thing, doing another. You got people trying to do a whole play in a shorter period of time. You got people who, ooh, this is a sword. <laughs> that generally ends up with somebody wrecking their hand, and now you have to sword fight with your left hand instead of your right hand. Because you hurt your hand because the other person's a lunatic who thought it'd be fun to go and actually do sword fighting. Everything's not pointing out well. Add to this the fact that this is a play of the supernatural. There are witches, there are ghosts, there are all kinds of evil things going on. And up until very recently, the presence of these evil things on stage is enough to make people be very, very alarmed. None of us wants to be proven wrong when it comes to dealing with the dark arts. None of us wants to get sort of in depth into that. We don't want to tread on the wrong toes. We don't want to walk on people's graves. We're all slightly superstitious to a degree. Some of these superstitions are based in common fact. This superstition about Macbeth is based on the experience of people who are not really wanting to do this play and now they have to, who really don't know how to sword fight and now they're hurting other people who have lost a member of their cast. Maybe their King Lear is dying. 
it's not a good way to start a play. I would never want to do Macbeth because I'm covering up another play that I was meant to be doing. Let's look at a little bit of the text. The very beginning of the play starts with three witches, and I'm going to go down through that little bit of text to begin with, okay? Uh -huh. Hang on, let me go. There, there we go. The scene, a desert place. There are no deserts in Scotland. It's just really a metaphorical word, meaning a place that is kind of desolate. Thunder and lightning. Back in those days, how would they have created it? Think about that for a moment. I want you, this is the third of your tasks for, to prove that you've watched the video. I want you to write how you think you would have done thunder and lightning in the times before um, proper sound effects, proper lighting effects. This was done outdoors on a stage. Enter three witches. When shall we three meet again, in thunder, lightning, or in rain? When the hurly-burly's done, when the battle's lost and won? That will be ere the set of sun. Where the place upon the heath, there to meet with Macbeth. I come, Grey Malcolm, Paddock calls, anon. Fair is foul, and foul is fair, hover through the fog and filth the air. Let's take a moment, we'll go down through the worst of it, because most of it's fairly straightforward. Hurly Burly is kind of like um, a tumult, a, uh, a battle, kind of like the, I know it in Irish and I can't put it in English, isn't that mad? The chaos, when the chaos done, but chaos doesn't fit a rhyming scheme, and it may not have even been available as a word back then. That'll be air the set of somewhere, the place upon the heath. Heaths, they're kind of cold, wet, uh, wind-blown uh, hills or hillocks. That would be like a moor, as you will often see in English literature, and that is, in many ways, a desert place. There's not much life. There's maybe heather and bracken, maybe some grass, you might get sheep on it, but it's not a place where humans can live without shelter. I come with, I come Grey Malkin. Grey Malkin is sort of an evil spirit, paddock similarly. So Anon is like, right, uh, hold up, soon, that kind of thing. And then we have this last line, fair is foul and foul is fair. Fair is foul and foul is fair. It's a chant. It's an incantation. All of it, all of this uh, sonnet is basically an incantation. Uh, and if you look, that's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, nearly fourteen lines. It's practically a sonnet, except it's short. You see, I come, Grey Malkin, Paddock calls, Anon, that would be one line. We have twelve lines, which is short of what a sonnet should be. And the sonnet was the standard poetic form of these days. Uh, they call playwrights poets because plays were meant to be written in poetry. And so he's doing a weird thing. Most of his plays open with a sonnet, 14 lines. Hamlet doesn't, and that's notable. Uh, but, you know, two households both alike in dignity and fair Verona where we lay our scene from Romeo and Juliet, that is a sonnet, the prologue. Most of the prologues are sonnets. This is short of a sonnet. We're waiting for more. We don't get more. And that sets the scene. We have these witches. Witches, there's no question in the time they're very superstitious people. Yeah, they may not be Catholic anymore, and they may not be that superstitious, but they believe in weird stuff. They're scared of what they don't understand, which is, you know, true of all of us. But we have this whole kind of opening, you know, that ends with a chant, an incantation. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. Fair is foul, and foul is fair. This is going to freak people out. Even if it is in the middle of a bright summer's day, the audience are told, when shall we three meet again, in thunder, lightning, or in rain? This is projecting for us an idea of Scotland, or at least their world in Scotland, being dark, murky, unpleasant. So, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to let you, hopefully you've all watched the uh, one of the film versions. But one of the links I have, and this will be, uh, it'll be saying something like, five openings to Macbeth. It will have five different openings. It's five movies from the last, since the 1971 one, which is really good. The one that Playboy sponsored, uh, presumably on condition that there was nudity, but the nudity is deformed women. So that's, that's uh, one in the eye for Playboy. 
But starting with the opening to that and following on, there are five different versions of the opening. Some being in very authentic a world, some being in sort of a fanciful world. Have a look at them. So this is your final task. Watch those five openings. Tell me which one you liked most. Was there, maybe you didn't like any of them, tell me that. Maybe you thought opening number four was really good. You'd like to see that one. Maybe you liked all of them. It's up to you. One of the versions is a version done in a more modern language. One of them is set in uh, World War I. Uh, that's the one that has Patrick Stewart in the whole of it. One of them is, uh, two of them are set in times past. And one of them is set in sort of modern times with uh, drug dealing. Those are those films. I've seen them all. They're They've all got something different to recommend them. Anyway, um, that's it. Hopefully this all made sense. Do all those things I've asked of you. And uh, I will be sending the next one out probably Tuesday night, Wednesday morning. You need to have watched this before you watch the second one, although it's well and good saying that now. But um, hopefully this helps. Please send me questions. Uh, I don't know how long we'll be doing this. We'll be doing this for a while. I don't know that we're going to be able to do the final project. Depends on where we stand in the beginning of April. Anyway, thanks for your time. Hope you enjoyed some of this. I'll see you soon. Bye.